All right, in this final video of this CSS Flexbox series, we're going to be taking a look at three very closely related properties available on Flex Child items. And those are called Flex Basis, Flex Grow, and Flex Shrink. So let's get into it. So the first property we're going to go into is Flex Basis. And let's start out with an observation here. So currently, I have this parent container here set to a fixed width of 800 pixels. And I have these child item divs each set to a width of 25%. Now I want to make some changes to these widths because I want to point something out to you. So on the parent container, instead of a width of 800 pixels, let's give it a responsive width value. Let's give it 77 VW, so 77 viewport widths. All right, and I set that as a starting point because that's approximately the equivalent of what we had before with that fixed 800 pixel width. So now we have a container that's responsive. So when we change the width of the viewport, this container will shrink and expand. Now for these child items, instead of giving those a percentage width, let's create a fixed width value. Let's give them each a width value of 200 pixels. So now what I want to point out to you is that even though the width of each one of these child items has a fixed 200 pixel value, because of the fact that we've given the container element a display of flex, when we shrink the viewport and that container shrinks, well, all the child items are going to shrink as well. And similarly, when we expand the viewport, they're going to expand. So take note of the fact here that even though the child items are set with a fixed width, once they're inside of a responsive flex container, those widths are going to be malleable. That is, they're going to be able to change. They're going to be able to shrink and expand. So the thing is with Flexbox, is that these child items within a container are malleable. And as we're going to see very shortly, once we start using the flex grow and flex shrink properties, the value that we give to width is not necessarily the value that we're going to end up with. And what I mean by that will become very clear to you shortly. But because of that fact, at least semantically, we need a new property that we can use in a flex context instead of width. And that property is what flex basis is. Oh, snap. So when we're defining a width on a flex child item, instead of using width, we want to use flex basis instead. So we can come into our child item and we can say 200 pixels for flex basis and save. And now this flex basis property is taking over the width that these child items are getting. And one important thing to know is that if you do have width and flex basis in the same rule, flex basis is going to override the width. So flex basis will win out. For example, if I gave each one of these child items a width of, let's say, 100 pixels, and I saved, well, we can see that they're each still 200 pixels because flex basis is overriding width here. If I comment out flex basis, now each of those child items are going to shrink to have a width of 100 pixels. Since we now know that we want to use flex basis instead of width when we're in a flex container context, let's just get rid of this width property here. And this leads me to the next thing that I want to point out about flex basis. And that is when we have flex direction of row, which is the default as we see now, flex basis is going to be sort of a replacement for width. But however, if we were to do flex direction column and then we save, well, now flex basis is giving a value in terms of height. And that may be a little bit confusing to see here right at the moment because the parent container, we just have a height of 200. But if we were to give it a height of 800, all right, now we can see that each one of those child items, 200, 400, 600, and 800, is taking up the full height of the container. So just as an example, if I was to give the parent container a greater height, let's say 1,000 pixels and I saved, well, now you can see that we have extra space in the container because the flex basis for each of these is only 200 pixels. So the bottom line there is that flex basis either represents width if we're dealing with a flex direction of row, or it represents height if we're dealing with a flex direction of column. Now before we move on to flex grow and flex shrink, let's look at some more details of flex basis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of flex direction column. I'm going to save and we're going to get back to that flex direction of row. I'm going to reset the height to the original 200 pixels. And now, instead of explicitly defining a flex basis, let's see what would happen if we just commented out flex basis. 
So what I want you to notice here is that even though we've commented out flex basis, flex basis by default is going to be auto. Meaning that the width of these child items, each one of them inside of this flex container, is going to be just enough to accommodate the text content inside. So as you can see here, this third one, for example, the word three has more letters than, let's say, the second one, the word two, and you can see it has a little bit greater width than this one. So each one of these widths, by default, is set to auto to just be wide enough to accommodate its text content. And now let's talk about one other very important thing about flex basis, and that is how it works in relationship to min width and max width. So let's bring back our flex basis of 200 pixels, and in the same child rule, let's give a max width value, and let's say that max width value is going to be 150 pixels. And let's save. And notice here that even though we've set a flex basis of 200 pixels, that flex basis is going to be constrained by this max width setting of 150 pixels. Similarly, if we comment out max width, and let's say that we gave a flex basis of 100 pixels. All right, and then we came in and we gave a min width, let's say of 175 pixels, and we saved. Well, now we can see the flex basis is also constrained by min width. So even though we gave a flex basis of 100 pixels, we said that the minimum width of any of these child items had to be 175 pixels. So remember that the resulting actual width of a child item that has a flex basis set is going to be constrained by any min width or max width settings. So at this point, we've looked at flex basis. And we said that when we're in the context of a flex container, we want to use flex basis instead of using width when we're dealing with a flex direction of row. And we want to use flex basis instead of height when we're dealing with flex direction of column. So now let's move into the flex grow and flex shrink properties because we're going to see how flex basis interacts with these. So the first thing we should do is let's just get rid of this min width and max width. Let's get rid of these properties here because we don't need them and we'll save. And now we can see that each of our items has a flex basis of 100 pixels. So let's look at flex grow first. So the first thing to know is that flex grow has a default value of zero. Meaning that even if there's extra space in the container, as there is here, these items are not going to grow, or they're not going to have any additional width beyond what their flex basis is set to. However, we can come here in this rule for the child class, which applies to all these child items, remember, and let's give it a flex grow property. And now let's set that flex grow property on all the child items to be one. And let's save. And now notice what's happened. That additional space in this container has now been filled up. And let me explain to you how that was done. So let's go back for a second. Let's comment out flex grow. In the remaining additional space that we do have in this container, it's about 400 pixels wide or so. So what's going to happen is if we give each of these child items a flex grow of 1, this remaining width of 400 pixels, it's going to be divided up into four equal parts. So we have 4 times 100. And since the flex basis of each of these child items is starting at 100 pixels, once we give them a flex grow value of 1, they're each going to now take on an additional 100 pixels. So each one is going to become 200 pixels wide, right? Because we have this 400 pixel available remaining space, and we're going to divide that up equally into four equal parts and give each one of these child items one of those parts. So we're going to give each one an additional 100 pixels. And if we uncomment flex grow with that value of one out, and we save, we can see that that's what it does. Now remember, Flex grow is a property that can be applied to flex child items. So what that means is that we can come into any of these child items individually and give it its own flex grow property. So for example, let's comment out that flex grow one, which now is being applied to all child items. And let's save, okay? And we're back to our kind of default. And now let's just give flex grow one to let's say the last child item, the fourth one here. So we'll come into this rule and we'll say flex grow one and let's save. And now you can see that that remaining additional space, that extra 400 pixels has been given completely to just this fourth child div. So if we do a quick check of its width, yeah, we can see it's about 500 pixels wide. Now the important thing to know about flex grow values is that they're relative. 
so they don't have any meaning in themselves necessarily, but only in relationship to each other. So what that means, for example, I can come into, let's say, my third child div, and I can give that one a flex grow of two. And let's save, and check out what's happened here. Remember, initially we had that 400 pixels of additional width in this container. And then we gave this third one a flex grow of two. We gave this fourth one a flex grow of one. So what we're saying is, take that 400 pixels of additional width, give two parts of that to the third child item, and give one part of that to the fourth child item, and add whatever that value is to that item's initial flex basis, which in this case is 100 pixels. So in this case, if we took 400 pixels and we divided it by three, okay, each one of those parts is gonna be approximately 133 pixels. So for this third child div, if we multiply 133 times two, that's gonna give us 266, and then we're gonna add that 266 to the initial flex basis of 100 to give us about 366 pixels in width. So let's check that out to verify that. And yeah, that's approximately what we have. And that fourth one that had a flex grow of one, what that one's gonna end up being is that 133 pixels plus the initial flex basis of 100 pixels for a total of 233 pixels. So let's check that one out. And yep, that's approximately what we have here. Now that we know about flex grow, flex shrink should be pretty easy to understand because it's really just the opposite. The one big difference though is that the default of flex shrink is actually one. Whereas remember the default of flex grow was zero. And maybe you've kind of observed that before, that when you reduce the width of a flex container, by default, the flex child items will shrink. So let's see that. Let's get rid of this flex grow on each of these child items. And we'll get rid of this commented out flex grow on the child item class rule. And here, as we had before, we had flex spaces set to 100 pixels, which left us with this additional remaining space in the container. Because let's just check out for a second about how wide this container is. It's about 800 pixels wide or so. So since it's 800 pixels wide, each one of these child item divs should only be able to have about 200 pixels in width. But let's try something. Let's try giving them each 400 pixels in width. And let's save. And obviously, they're not actually 400 pixels in width because that would be impossible, right? Because then we would have 1600 pixels in width fitting in an 800 pixel wide container, which just wouldn't be possible. So the reason that they are fitting though is because by default, flex shrink is set to a value of one. So all of that additional width that each of these child items is asking for is gonna be reduced or shrunk equally. And because flex shrink is set to one, if we reduce the container, all the child items are going to shrink in width as well. Now, of course, we can come into the individual child rules like we did before with flex grow, and we can apply different flex shrink properties to each one of them. And just as with flex grow, the values that we're gonna to give to the flex shrink properties are going to be relative to each other. So for example, let's say that I gave this second child div a flex shrink value of two. Remember the default is one. So if this one has a flex shrink value of two, that means it's going to shrink twice as much as the other items. So let's save, and we can see that take effect. So thanks for checking out this video all about CSS Flexbox. If you enjoyed the video, if you feel like you got some value out of it, please give the video a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and also if you can, let me know in the comments down below what other topics you'd like to see covered. See you next time.